Mike Dunleavy's budget proposal last year cut spending while still seeking to pay full PFDs. This year, the governor has proposed a budget that doesn't make deep cuts, but leaves a $1.5 billion shortfall to be covered by the Constitutional Budget Reserve, one of the state's rapidly diminishing savings accounts. Meanwhile, oil is hovering around $50 per barrel. So what's changed in the past year, and what does the governor envision for Alaska's future? Here to discuss his budget plan and his ideas for stabilizing state spending is Governor Mike Dunleavy. Governor Dunleavy, welcome to Talk of Alaska. Great to be here, Lori. Thank yeah. you. Thanks so much for being here on this snowy day. Mm -hmm. You Alaskans can also join us. What should the budget's main priority be? Where do you want to see uh, increased or decreased spending? Have you had last year's budget cuts affected you, and do you think it's time to change the permanent fund formula? You can call us statewide at 1-800-478-8255. 1-800-478-8255. If you're in Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422, 550-8422. You can also email uh, questions or comments to talk at alaskapublic.org. Governor, last summer lawmakers couldn't reach consensus on where to hold a special session. There appeared to be a kind of a combative stance between your administration and lawmakers. So how are you feeling about the current session and where lawmakers are with addressing state spending? Are you happy? Are you frustrated? What what what's the what's the tone right now? Well, it's it, this is just a, it, it's a continuation of the discussion we've been having for several years. Um, Alaska quite frankly, has grown used to spending money every year, increasing budgets every year, because we were very fortunate with the amount of oil we had, the production, the price. And, um, you know, our last price spike was back in about 2011-12, when it hit about $145 a barrel. There was talk at that time that it would hit $200 a barrel. But unbeknownst to, uh, I, I think, a lot of the um, uh, folks that, that uh, uh, predict these things, the uh, the uh, technology surrounding fracting really started to come into play very quickly. As a result, the uh, we have now become you know, the United States of America is now the largest energy producer in the world. Nobody would have thought that ten years ago. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there were discussions about peak oil that we we've, we've maxed out their ability to um, to produce oil. But long and short of it is, um, you know, with, with the Permian Basin, with the Bakken, with other plays around the world. There is, uh, there is a lot of oil, as you mentioned earlier. Oil is now down in the 50s again. When I came into office, when I was campaigning, um, October, a month before the election, oil hit $85 a barrel. If it had held, as some had predicted, because they felt that the uh, Chinese economy was humming and our economy was humming, they would have given us an extra $2 billion of revenue in my first term. Um, when we came into office um, in December and early January, oil was in the mid-50s again. We lost about $2 billion, of, $2 billion of potential revenue. So we had to make some difficult decisions. We were hoping to do a step-down approach with the legislature. And, Lori, th this is nothing new. You mentioned that this is, we've been wrestling this for several years, with this for several years. When I was a senator, uh, myself and other legislators said that we, we can't sustain the spending of Unless we had oil at 140 bucks a barrel, you ride the ferry often. Um, are you an uh, individual that has a private business that's concerned that um, you, there may be taxes imposed upon you and that your margins aren't that great to begin with for, for your business to survive? It, Alaska is very diverse. Um, rural, urban, uh, it's a big state, and um, people have a lot of different opinions. What I think we, what I was hoping to get people to do, and I, I believe they're there, is to agree that we have a fiscal issue. The question right now is whether we're going to tap into the earnings reserve uh, even further than we have, potentially jeopardizing the uh, the uh, the permanent fund going forward in terms of its ability to continue to generate revenue and grow. Are we going to tax ourselves now to pay for government that we want now and services that we want now? One of the things that we've been trying to do in our administration is, is make things more efficient, um, have conversations with people, are there services and programs that we could do without that don't touch all Alaskans. But it's been, it's been a very difficult discussion, obviously. Um, and so what we did this year was we rolled out a budget that was a flat budget because last year the budget reductions took the air out of the room. There was really no other conversation about the constitutional amendments that we laid on the table. And those constitutional amendments have to do with a spending limit. 
have to do with uh, having the people involved and in how they want the PFD and the permanent fund looking uh, looking at like going forward, and also whether the people of Alaska wish to be taxed. I think those are very important questions to ask the people of Alaska. Um, right now, the legislature appears not to be moving those. Uh, we'll see what happens. But we put out a flat budget so that we can have a discussion as to what are the sideboards we need, in my opinion, on the budget so that if we have to ask for new revenue or more revenue from somewhere, that the people of Alaska could be assured that we aren't going to just continue to grow spending, uh, continue to spend more money. For example, we would like the legislature to look at our formula programs that automatically drive increases to our budget of about $100 million a year. These would be contracts, the formula spending for education, some health-related services. Right. If, if, if we don't want to address those, which would be a decision by the legislature and the people of Alaska, then we have to be prepared to add $100 million new revenue on top of the $1.5 billion deficit we have now. So you can see how it becomes a, a, a difficult proposition. In other words, we can't continue to do what we're doing. And have been doing. So we either reduce, we look for new revenues, we reduce and or look for new revenues. We're going to have to make that decision. We're running out of time because we're running out of savings. What do you think about uh, former Lieutenant Governor Mead Treadwell had a proposal uh, that he published in, in sort of an op-ed in the paper several weeks ago about building the permanent fund main corpus up over a hundred billion dollars and then it would sort of be like this endowment that could be revenue could be split 50 50 between state spending and and permanent fund dividends but it would take some reductions in in the interim time to get there so reductions to uh the split between pfds and state spending what are, you, what are your thoughts about that i um you know i i i i, I commend um uh me for for me, me, needs a thinker, and he's uh, he's trying to solve problems. And I, I think it's a, 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 I think it's an interesting proposal or an interesting approach. Mm. What I would say is, until we decide what our sideboards on are on our spending through a spending and appropriation limit that actually works, meaning, right now we could spend fifteen percent a year if we want. Our economy can't afford that. We, and have, there, there have been times here in the past couple of years we've spent, we've increased spending by 15% a year. We can't do that. So where I'm going with this is, I think the people of Alaska would be more open to those discussions on revenue or changing the permanent fund if they could be assured that we in Juneau are going to stick uh, stick to a budget like we do at home, that we're going to spend, we're going to, we're going to service our electrical bill, our car insurance, et cetera, and we hem ourselves in with a revised appropriation limit. If we don't do that, even the proposal that um, that uh, Me Treadwell, Lieutenant Governor Me Treadwell, put uh, was proposing, if the rates of spend we've been doing the past several years, we may eat into that, and that may not be enough. In government, there's never enough, and that's just it's just the way it is. And so, I think if we can get an appropriation limit, a spending limit a spending limit that caps what politicians can spend year to year, I think then you'll have Alaskans saying, okay, we well, that's, okay, we got that in place. Let's look at additional revenues to service things like police and schools uh, and roads. What would that spending limit, how would that work? Uh, because a, a rigid cap can't take into account unforeseen natural disasters and other things. So how would something like that work? Where, where's the flexibility? So you're really trying to hem in your operating growth. In other words, adding, just adding new programs to add new programs. Um, it, 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 right now, we don't have the money for capital, for example. And after this year, we may not have a lot of money to deal with disasters because the CBR is going to be spent down to service mm -hmm. what is an operating budget issue. And so the idea would be you put a spending limit in that says we're not going to increase our budgets uh, year by year by more than 2%. And then what you can do is you can put into the um, uh, constitutional amendment, you can put in an opener, meaning uh, every three years or five years, the people of Alaska will revisit this. Um, you can put contingencies in there, but it's, it's got to be a, a sincere approach to hemming ourselves in because we can game the system and we can put all kinds of things in a constitutional amendment that have so many holes that it becomes worthless. And so I think we could take into account those, those things you're talking about. The other spending limit that has always existed, that has caused consternation past year, is the ability for the governor to veto. 
The framers of the Constitution, this is not something that I invented. I think people, some people uh, believe that this is something that I created. The framers of the Constitution debated this issue heavily during the Constitutional Convention. They debated what powers the governor should have so that there's a check and balance system in our government. And the framers opted for a strong executive. We, by Constitution, have the strongest executive in the country. In the country. And a, the, the ability to veto was part of it. And, Lori, let me just add, add, add to this. Even with that, in the end, it's the legislature that's the strongest body. Why? They're the ones that decide the budget in the end. If they don't like the fact that the governor has vetoed because we don't have money to spend, they can override it. If they choose not to override it, that's the legislature's decision. That's the way the framers put this together. And so I know this past year, um, a lot of the um, angst has been laid on the executive, myself, for the reductions in attempting to get our budget under control. But in the end, people, I think, forget that the legislature themselves agreed to over $200 million in reductions. This included Republicans and Democrats, and that they chose not to override the vetoes. And so we, um, we have to look to the legislature for some ideas to, to help, get out of, help, help us get out of this. But I am more than willing to work with the legislature. I've laid out my ideas. We'll continue to discuss the ideas. But in the end, it's the legislature that has the power, and um, I think a lot of Alaskans are curious as to what some of their solutions are as well. If you're just joining us, this is Talk of Alaska, and today Governor Mike Dunleavy joins us to talk about the way forward for the state and how to resolve the state funding budget gap. 1-800-478-8255 is the number statewide if you'd like to join the conversation. If you have questions or comments, 1-800-478-8255. In Anchorage, the number is 550-8422, 550-8422. You can also email us, talk at alaskapublic.org. We've got a number of emails we're going to get to in just a little bit. Uh, let's go to Dave in Anchorage. Hi, Dave. Uh, good morning, Lori, and greetings to the governor, Lori, and, and the rest of Alaskans. I am calling from Anchorage. It, as we begin 2020, uh, it's helpful to remember that just two years ago, Mr. Dunleavy, on the campaign trail, promised Alaskans that under his administration, there would be no cuts to state troopers, no cuts to the court system, no cuts to public education, no cuts to power cost equalization, no cuts to prisons, no cuts to pioneer homes, and no cuts to the University of Alaska. But right after making these promises and getting elected, the governor hired an outsider, Don Arduin, and did just the opposite of what he promised Alaskans. The people did not vote for the governor they got. Americans for prosperity for oil producers and other large corporations and other business interests, such as the Alaska Policy Forum, essentially paid for the governor's election, and they took control of our economic messaging and roadshow. Of course, this messaging avoids the easiest and most important way for Alaskans to promptly restore a portion of our historical Bay production revenues. Alaskans overwhelmingly support the idea that we should receive a fair portion of our Pudo Bay oil lease vote. But that is not happening now. Why? Because the last time our oil taxes were changed, uh, we went from $19 billion in revenue from 2009 to 13 to not even one billion, actually negative in the, from 2015 to uh, 2019. So this is an extreme and unbalanced system as our oil threat has ever been. Stability means fairness to both producers and Alaska, not one-sided profits. So so Dave, can you, do you have a question? Can you get to a question? I'll get to, I'll get to the finish in, in 60 seconds. How's that okay? Nope, gotta be quicker than that. We got a lot of calls stacking up, a lot of other people that want to get on. I would encourage uh, the governor and uh, our fellow Alaskans to um, vote for Alaska's Fair Share. Uh, it's got a website, and uh, we will, um, that'll make being governor easier because we'll have about a thousand million dollars in annual revenue restored. And uh, that, that's the point I wanted to make. So I'm sorry I didn't have a full three minutes, but people can go to the vote Disgraceful website. caller so, can't even uh, ask a simple, a straightforward money. question of our governor. Absolutely disgraceful. All right. Thank you, Dave, for your comments. And um, 
Governor, this is something that I'm sure you hear a lot, that people want more money out of the oil producers. What do you say about that? Um, they're, uh, they're, we, we need to have a balance, meaning if, if we can get more money out of the oil companies and it doesn't change the oil company's behavior, meaning um, if more taxes, for example, could be had without any change in behavior, that would be, I think that would be an interesting conversation, it, it would. Um, you have countries that tax a lot, and you have states that tax a lot, and oftentimes that, uh, that promotes certain behaviors. Investment in other places, or people leaving. You know, we're, we're following this, we just want to make sure that um, uh, we have the oil industry here, I think people need to understand that I've never worked for the oil companies. I was a teacher, a principal, and a superintendent in rural Alaska, and uh, a school board member in uh, urban Alaska in Matsu. So I'm not an oil person. I'm not an oil guy. Um, and uh, quite frankly, you know, the, there was an insinuation that I may be controlled or owned by outside interests. Uh, I ran to represent the individual Alaskans that aren't con that aren't part of associations or interests in the state of Alaska are controlled by outside. But anyway, uh, the long story short is, we can talk about revenues, but again, unless we act upon sideboards, these revenues will only last a certain time before our spending outgrows even the revenues that were just mentioned. Well, let's um, let's stay with the phones for just a moment and go to Dan in Juneau. Hi, Dan. Hi. You're going to need to turn your radio down so we don't get feedback. Okay. Hi. Good morning, Lori. Good morning. Um, uh, and thanks for taking my question. Um, Governor Dunleavy, I'm just curious um, why your administration and Senator Stedman is prioritizing the Cake to Petersburg single lane unpaved road, a project which is projected to cost anywhere between 40 to $143 million dollars instead of immediately investing those millions into our ferries? No, good question. Yeah, very good question. So um, the you know, roads are cheaper, uh, no, no matter where you are. Roads, roads end up being cheaper in the long run uh, once they're put in and they're maintained. It allows more freedom and access. I don't uh, necessarily agree with the cost that the, uh, that the caller cited. I think it's less than that, much less than that. But nonetheless, you're you're looking at, uh, for example, right now, we have um, we have we have uh, a number of ships. The Malaspina is 57 years old and it's laid up for for work. The Matanuska is 57 years old and it's over, being overhauled. The, the Tuscany, 56, the Lacanti, 46, the Columbia, 46. They're all being overhauled. In other words, the ships were not maintained over the past several decades. They weren't on a maintenance schedule. And so now all uh, these ships are, are offline on my watch. I know there's a number of people that believe that I'm pulling them off for some other nefarious reason, but the fact of the matter is, these ships have operating issues right now. You have a road, uh, you maintain the road, you have free access, you have folks moving back and forth. And so I think the idea uh, is to provide reliable transportation to people, uh, Alaskans in Southeast and on our coast. And um, we, we're putting together a working group that's going to examine the best way to, 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 to provide that transportation for Alaskans on the coast and in South, South Central and Southeast. And so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna rely on this working group, which is going to be made up of Alaskans. It will be announced soon. And those folks are hopefully are going to give us guidance as to what it should look like going forward. Should, should it be just a, a boat, a ferry system? Should it be a ferry system and airport system? Should it be an airport system, ferry system, and road system? These are the questions that need to be answered. There are a lot of people that want roads, and there are many people that don't want roads. That's part of the diversity of Alaska. Well, let's stick with that ferry issue uh, for a moment. The, there were protests last week uh, in several coastal communities. And you were mentioning the, the cost comparison. Your former budget director, Donna Ardwin, said it costs two cents per mile on a highway, four and a half dollars or a little more for the, the marine highway. Is that a fair comparison, though? And, and does it take into account the economic driver for Southeast Alaska uh, communities that the marine highway represents? There's no doubt. I mean, there's, there's no doubt it, it assists. It assists in travel. It assists in the movement of... Um, 
of goods and services. There's no doubt that it does. The, the question is, in this, in this fiscal climate that we have, and that's going back to that particular issue, in the fiscal climate that we have, is, is there a way that we can make things more efficient across the board, across all of state government, including the transportation systems in the state of Alaska, which also include the Alaska Marine Highway System? The issue before us right now are the aging boats. And what are we going to do about those aging boats to get them back online? And how much are we willing to invest, for example, in new boats? And so this, uh, this working group, I think, is absolutely needed. It's going to have some, I, I believe, uh, terrific people associated with the uh, ferries, associated with the uh, economic and commerce of South Central and Southeast Alaska. But the long and short of it is, we are, I am determined to provide a sustainable transportation system for, for all of Alaska, including Southeast and South Central. But even if we do bring the boats back online, get them repaired, get new boats, some communities won't have ferry service until next winter. What would you say to those residents who now can't afford to get to, you know, basic things like medical appointments or get their car fixed? Well, we're, we're, we're going to work as hard as we can, as quickly as we can, um, to get things fixed for this situation regarding the uh, transportation system, the marine highway system. Again, I, I you know, I, I, I don't mind dealing with issues on my watch. As a matter of fact, that's my job. But we do have a number of ships that have aged out that are not working. And a big part of that was they were not on a deferred maintenance program. They were not on a maintenance schedule over the past several decades that uh, would have prevented some of this uh, ha from happening now under our watch this summer, this fall, and going into the winter. We, we can't put out boats that don't work. We can't, uh, we can't put out boats that uh, are not safe, and we're working as quickly as possible to get some of these boats up and running. And uh, we're going to do the best we can. Right, and, and that's one issue, is having enough uh, vessels in the fleet. But the other issue is enough funding so that there are there's regular service for some of these communities. How do you balance that? That's the discussion that we're having in Juneau. Last year when we reduced the system because of the fiscal issue, the $1.6 billion gap, um, we again had consensus in the legislature to reduce the budget, um, about $200 million was the first go around. And the ferry system was part of that because of reduced ridership over the years in the hopes that schedules could be condensed and uh, it, be, it, it could be a, a more efficient uh, system, a more efficient process. Then what happened was in August of, of this year, there was a strike by the union during the time when the ferry brings in its most, uh, the most money, right? You have the end of the tourist season going on. That strike prevented the, uh, the Alaska Marine Highway System from collecting fares during that time. Then you had a combination of uh, a, a series of boat repairs and breakdowns that have occurred. And so there's no doubt all of this has conspired to cause a, uh, an issue in Southeast in terms of transportation on the ferry. Again, we're working through this, but we have to decide if we're going to go with just boats. We do have to come up with a budget that's going to support that. We're going to have to come up with a budget that has a maintenance schedule that supports that. That's a discussion. Is it going to be a combination of boats, airports, and um, roads? That will alter the number of boats and the number of routes. So that's the discussion that needs to happen, and we're trying to do this as quickly as possible to get answers. Lawmakers, uh, as you noted earlier, failed to override your budget vetoes at the start of the session. Now there's other efforts to sort of claw back money uh, in, in various ways, uh, a small examples, um, although not for the community of Wrangell, but the House Fisheries Subcommittee wants to restore funding for Wrangell's Fish and Game Office, $700,000 also for crab and salmon studies. If these types of measures pass both, both chambers, are they the type that you're likely to veto these, these measures that will bring back uh, services um, to smaller communities? And so these are measures that can add up, but kind of a piecemeal approach. What are your thoughts about that? Um, we, uh, we, 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 we have to work together on getting out of this fiscal situation that we're in with the deficit. Spending more money doesn't necessarily get you out of it. Um, there may be addbacks that are absolutely needed for the for the function of government. But again, we we can't pretend that the issue 
is something that is created by one person, the governor. The fiscal issue has been haunting us now for several years. Our spending has been out of line with our revenues. If we're going to keep spending, what is the discussion and what kind of revenues uh, does the uh, legislature wish to propose and what can they get passed within their body of 60 people? If the legislature wants to impose an income tax on the people of Alaska, they have the ability to do that. They just get the votes to do it. If, if I thought that that income tax or the way it was constructed was wrong for Alaska, again, I could veto that. But the legislature can override that veto. In other words, they have the tools available to them as a body to fix the fiscal issue, to determine what the budget's going to look like, uh, to pass laws, to pass revenue measures. They, they are the body that can do this. And are you giving them ideas about what you would tolerate in that regard as far as an income tax? If a lawmaker comes to you and says, look, I'm going to introduce this bill, are there, is there some uh, discussion about what would you not veto? Well, you, you're talking hypotheticals. You have to see the bill when it comes out of the committees and it's finally voted on because there are amendments even right up to the last second on the floor. So to say that, uh, you know, I, I would uh, allow or I would support uh, X number of bill or a bill 125, SB 125, or whatever number we want to attach to a bill, you, you've got to see what that bill is going to be at the end. But I will say this if we're going to just focus on revenues, then that means we're just focused on spending. And from what I hear from Alaskans, they want us to control our spending. So that question, I think we're putting a cart before the horse. You have a spending limit that's been introduced last year, a revenue limit as part of the spending limit that's been introduced last year. If it's adopted and it's, it works, the language in that is going to be very important as well, then I think the people of Alaska are, gonna, are going to accept revenue measures, because here's the deal, and I'll be very brief. We impose an income tax on the people of Alaska. They have the right to overturn it in an election. Then there's no, there's no sustainable fiscal plan. Why not get the people up front, I've been saying this for years, up front to be part of creating the fiscal plan, allow them to vote, on some of these measures, and then you know for a fact that they'll support them. But if they don't support them and you impose it upon the people of Alaska, they can reject it through an initiative, a repeal, a referendum. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll take more calls, more questions uh, for Governor Mike Dunleavy on with us today on Talk of Alaska as Talk of Alaska continues statewide. The Federal Subsistence Board is seeking applicants to fill seats on the 10 subsistence regional advisory councils. Councils meet twice a year and provide critical advice to the board on subsistence management issues. Individuals may apply themselves or nominate someone as an applicant. Application deadline is Monday, March 2nd, 2020. More at doi.gov slash subsistence slash regions or call 800-478-1456. This message is sponsored by the Office of Subsistence Management. talk of Alaska. We've got Governor Mike Dunleavy on with us today talking about the way forward for the state. Uh, we do have some breaking news that's coming in. The group Stand Tall with Mike, uh, the group that's defending the governor against the recall campaign in the Alaska Supreme Court, announced this morning that it's dropping its legal defense and suggested that the court's Chief Justice Joel Bolger is biased against the governor. Governor, is that a position that you agree with, and what's uh, what's known, if you have an idea, uh, about the basis for suggesting that Bolger and other judges cannot rule fairly? What are your thoughts about that? So I'm, I'm going, you, you, Laura, you're just reading to me right. what's something that just came on just your happening. screen. So I haven't had an opportunity to look at uh, any press release to actually see what it says. Um, if, if the question is, do I believe that the courts are going to um, uh, give my case a fair shake, I don't have the answer to that, to be honest with you. Meaning, the, uh, the, a recall process in Alaska is supposed to be a recall, not a political recall, like there, like there is in other states, for example, in Wisconsin. 
that type of recall, you can be recalled for any reason, but what you do is you run in a race against other people. In Alaska, it's a recall like for cause, and there are certain standards. Um, it appears that the court is fast-tracking the, the, this, this process to get it on the ballot. That's what it appears to be. But I have no idea. I mean, the Supreme Court's got to uh, uh, hear, the, uh, hear the issue and render a decision. But um, uh, the, the, the group that was supporting me, and I had heard rumblings about this here just a day or so ago, that um, uh, the belief was that uh, it was pointless to continue with the legal approach to this and uh well, now what would be the recourse i mean what what would they propose to do if you can't go to the courts that the courts are going to put this on the ballot and then we have a campaign you mentioned the distinctions in the constitution but alaska has a pretty liberal interpretation of what a recall can be mounted for does it not uh there's certain there, there, are, there are standards that have to be breached and what the recall, the folks that are supporting the recall are saying is that there are standards that are breached. We're saying we don't agree that there were standards breached. We are hoping, or we're hoping, that the courts would take a look at that and rule and say, no, uh, you know, there's the, the standard for uh, incompetence was not breached, or the standard for fitness for duty was not breached. Um, we don't, it doesn't appear that that's going to happen. And so we're, we have to gear up for a campaign so that the people of Alaska can weigh in and decide whether they believe that this uh, this this recall, whether this governor should stay in office. The interesting thing about this is if if it goes the way it looks like it's going, anybody and everybody that's elected to office in the state of Alaska, under the ruling that came out in the uh, uh, lower court, anybody and everybody can be recalled for any reason going forward. Meaning, you don't even have to prove the fact that there was a breach. If you put your petition together and you do it within 200 words and you get your signatures, uh, if this holds, it can go on the ballot. That's going to have, a, in, in my opinion, the opinion of others, lawyers, uh, retired judges, you name it, is going to have a detrimental effect in the state of Alaska. And I'll tell you why. The Last year, the legislature, many legislators voted to not follow the law on the PFD. Many legislators voted to ignore the law on the 90-day session. Under, under where it appears that this is going, they would have violated the law and thus breached at least one of the standards. Therefore, if you have enough money, you could go into a Senate or House district and just with a few thousand signatures, get a recall on the ballot and recall one of those legislators for that breach. This is this is going to end up. Uh, this is going to happen with mayor, city council members, school board members, uh, you name it. There were supposed to be standards. There were supposed to be standards that that uh, were were fairly rigorous, so that the election that folks were elected in the original election, such as the one I was elected in, that they're not disenfranchised, or that we don't have to do a re a, a re election uh, every every year, every two years. This was, the, this was the purpose to have terms. But in answer to your question, I'll sum it up. If it appears that where the courts are going is a political recall, and all you need are the signatures and enough money to get um, uh, in on the ballot, then every elected official in the state of Alaska uh, has the potential of facing a recall pretty quickly, pretty easily. Well, I do want to move on to, we've got a lot of calls stacked up here and a lot of other questions, but just the idea of saying a political recall that's that's the term that I think is at issue here is who makes that determination about is it a is it just based purely on partisan politics or is it based on uh, actual merit and isn't that the standard that has to be met by getting 71,000 signatures or more you have to get this number of people to agree that they uh, they think there is merit you have to, first of all, the Division of Elections, which is under right. Lieutenant Governor, uh, disagreed with the petition and said that there was not merit. The recall group then filed suit. The judge in the lower court, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not a legal expert, but basically said um, uh, the, it's, they, they've, got the, they've got the signatures when they have a petition. There was no hearing on whether the, uh, the standards, the, the uh, accusations were 
support it. We're 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 ruled as um, as actually happening. In other words, if you're a if, if you're a um, uh, you could be accused of a, a, a violation or, 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 or some other uh, of incompetence, fitness for duty, whatever it is, and it could be a very uh, nebulous or and you know uh, nebulous accusation. If it's not heard and if the courts don't rule whether it's true or not, then it doesn't matter. It's just getting the petition and getting the signatures, and that's where we're at in Alaska. It wasn't supposed to be this way. If you look at what the framers of the Constitution said. There are supposed to be certain standards that were clearly breached. Is that a constitutional amendment that you think is needed to to change that standard? I I, to be honest, I haven't given you. I, excuse me, I haven't given that any thought. I'm. This is all new ground for everybody uh, here in the state of Alaska. Um, but the the interesting thing about the recall is most people I've talked to, the vast majority, I've even had folks that are that are part of the recall to recall me have said. This is being done because we don't like the agenda and we don't like the reductions. Those aren't grounds for a recall. Those are policy decisions. So that's what makes this very interesting. Um, we'll see where, I mean, it's going to be interesting where this goes. All right, let's go back to the phones. Terry is in Valdez. Hi, Terry. Yeah, I was going to talk about SB21. One of the things I wanted to address is the difference between royalties and taxes. To me, taxes are a business that makes money and they pay taxes accordingly. Prudhoe Bay is an owner, we're an owner state. We own that oil that's sitting under the ground. We own that oil that's going down the line. We're only getting a 17% royalty. Well, that's not a tax, it's a royalty, and we should be getting a much higher one than we are. SB21 reduced that, and we're getting kickbacks, giving kickbacks for drilling incentives. So, you know, Norway gets. 80% of their, you know, they're an owner state too. Uh, so why call it a tax? That, that's the question I have. Thanks. Well, I, I, I think, if I understand what the caller was saying, um, we are the owners, so we do get a royalty. The owners get a royalty. If you were in Texas, it'd be the landowner that gets the royalty because they own the uh, mineral rights underneath them. But in Alaska, those uh, mineral rights have been collectivized under the state. So we are the uh, landowner and we get a royalty. Again, the, the, the debate, and it's been going on for some time, is um, is, uh, is the state of Alaska and the people of Alaska, uh, quote, getting a fair share? And again, it's, the, uh, it's oil. It's oil in Alaska, the oil industry, that for over 40 years has underwritten everything that we have. And our production is dropping. We are optimistic that there is going to be an additional 200 to 300,000 barrels of new oil uh, coming online over the next several years because of investments made in the North Slope by a number of different companies. The, the question again before us is how do we keep that investment going and how do we keep the oil flowing and how do we diversify this economy? so that we can really build a state that's going to be durable for our kids and grandkids. That's really the question at hand, and that's the stuff we're wrestling with right now. All right, let's stay with the phones for a moment. Wilson is in Bethel. Hi, Wilson. Hi, I'd like to um, bring up a really important point that everyone in the legislation and in the uh, state government for just Alaska, you know, it's a well-known fact that push Alaska like Bethel and Southeast, you know, get your can. All the communities that are off, not on the road system, you know, their budget for any kind of operation is actually notoriously low. Like it's 70, like 50% off the mark for operation. You know, I can get, I work in the, uh, with the senior service for OMC and just placing the food orders here like Three pounds, a thousand dollars a pound. Three thousand uh, dollars. This plate alone is for landing here in Bethel is almost twenty-seven hundred. Almost the same amount of. Uh, there, there goes your food budget for the for the month or whatever. You know, and that's your choice. It's it's a well-known fact that that's how it's always been. So my question is why, you know, why hasn't the legislators or the people in charge, you know, make the, a lot of a lot of changes for the on you know, off road system communities that operate senior services, especially the senior service program. You know, we need to have funding for that is um, real and doable because right now it's not. Uh, 
that's all it made me wanted to say. Thank you. All right, thank you, Wilson, for that comment that, that uh, he's struggling with um, how to support seniors in rural communities. It kind of, it's a good lead into the larger issue of public safety and other services for rural Alaska. So, Governor, taking Wilson's um, question first about how to help out with uh, addressing the needs for seniors. Well, we have an aging population, and um, we're going to have to make some decisions on how we're going to support that aging population. Alaska used to be a young state. Folks came here and work. Uh, uh, folks that were born and raised here are staying here. Their families are staying here. Um, and I think that's a good thing. The question is, how do we pay for these services going forward? Not, not whether these services are necessary or good. That, that's not the issue. The issue is, how do we pay for them? And one of the things I've been trying to have a, uh, as part of the conversation with the people of Alaska is, how willing are Alaskans, uh, how willing are they to support resource development projects? How willing are they su uh, there to support mining projects, um, opening ANWR, um, possible mining and timber in the Tongass? And again, because we have a diverse state, you get mixed, uh, you get mixed opinions. Some people don't want that. But then when you ask them, how are we going to create jobs for our young people? How are we going to create uh, revenue for, for local municipalities and uh, the ability to pay for, uh, pay for the services that they want? Sometimes there are losses to explain how we do that other than tax, let's say the oil companies are tax individual Alaskans. But we have all these resources in the state of Alaska, more than anywhere else in this country. Gold, silver, timber, fish. Uh, you name it, oil, gas, rare earths. Uh, we have the largest graphite deposit in North America uh, by Nome, Alaska. These are, all, uh, these are all resources that are in demand, not just f uh, by, by Americans, but by the world. And do we want to capitalize on this, put people to work, uh, create wealth, create revenue so we can pay for some of the things that we're talking about? Or do we enter into this strange situation where our costs keep growing, but we have made a decision that we don't want to develop our resources to help pay for those services? We have to have that discussion. Alaska's very existence, Lori, people forget this, was predicated upon its ability to develop its resources. There was question whether they were going to let us into the union as a state, because they felt that with a small population, we would not be able to support ourselves in a broad-based tax with 150 to 200,000 people back then. So there was basically a demand that we collectivize our resources under the government and develop them to produce the revenue to underwrite government. If Alaskans are now starting to say, we don't want to develop these mining plays and these timber stands and these oil plays, how are they expecting to pay for government going forward. Do you think that it's a, a more of a discussion about what people consider resources and resource development? Uh, for example, tourism is a, a very large and very much growing part of the Alaska economy. Certainly it can't replace what we've seen from the North Slope. Uh, and, and so do you think that there has to be a a larger conversation about what people consider developing resources for maximizing those resources for the good of all Alaskans. Well, sure. I mean, I, I think any and all resources should be on the table. I mean, absolutely, tourism is a is a bright, growing star in Alaska's, um, I think, portfolio of resources. But it doesn't have to be an either or. It doesn't have to be just tourism and nothing. Thanks for joining.